welcome to the Naughty Child Podcast. With me, Richard. And me, Polly. I'm the dad. And I'm the daughter. Getting called out in the middle of the night to go carve a cow to do a cesarean. It's the closest thing to farming you can do in the middle of Bristol. And then mum put on YouTube and then now it's there for the world to see, so it's great. But England were very chirpy. And I think I only cried like four times, but they just happened to get all four times on camera, okay? <laughs> Lock myself in a procedure room. <laughs> whether it shows something about me or whether it just shows I'm a little bit stupid. I love people and I love cricket. Suddenly I'm out on a helicopter because I can go on a glacier. And... It's been the longest year ever, hasn't it? <laughs> My dog is now called Jimmy Anderson. So I learned the anthem because I really genuinely thought they would make us sing it. So Polly, we've had loads of amazing feedback following last week's episode and the amazing interview with me. Um, I mean, lots is probably an exaggeration. It's, um, I mean... Looking at the social media, it was going absolutely wild. I mean, I think I think my episode got at least four likes and then you posted it on YouTube and it sat there for three days and no one watched it. And now, after four days, it's had one watch. Yay! That is star quality. I am drawing in the masses, I tell you. Well, I'm so glad we paid such a big fee to get you on because it was so worth it wasn't it yeah I just feel a little bit um yeah yeah it hasn't done much for my self-esteem it would be fair to say <laughs> no don't say it. it's got it's got listens just not on YouTube it's all right people just want to hear your voice they don't care about the thumbnail with your face in it <laughs> <laughs> thanks that that makes it sound even worse ah it's all good it's all good it's been a good week for Amy Hunter, who got her first ever IT20 century. She's a good player, isn't she? She is very good. Um, so, of course, she's she's quite known for getting a century because on mm. her 16th birthday, she scored a century against Zimbabwe. And then age 18 and something, she... A veteran. <laughs> Really old age now. She got a century against Zimbabwe again in a T20. I mean, that is some going, isn't it? To get a century in a T20 game, you you have got to be scoring quite rapidly. Well, it was it was from sixty six balls or something as well. So it, yeah. it it was really rapid. Um, so it was very impressive. And Ireland have been absolutely fantastic out in Zimbabwe. They've won all of their games so far. I think the game today was washed out. I know there were a lot of rain delays. And then they're playing tomorrow as well in the final T20. Um, but yeah, they've done really, really well. And it's not been, obviously some players have been really consistent, but it's been a lot of different players putting their hand up and doing well. So all of Prendergast as well. Uh, Friend of the pod. Friend of the pod. Laura Delaney, um, Cara Murray. There's been a, a whole host of players who have done well. So that's really positive to see. Um, and we spoke about it last week, I think, and previous weeks, but the development of Ireland in cricket is really exciting with the contracts they've brought in and it seems to really be working because um, players players are coming along really nicely. And I think when you look at the global qualifiers for the T20 World Cup, they are going to be a very strong team. And if I were Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Vanuatu, I'd be be worried about Ireland. Mm. Oh, 100%. Um, I guess we we said they've got a big advantage in that they are professional, or most of them are, and or semi pro student contracts, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I would be cons- I would be very worried if I was another nation in, in those qualifiers because I think Ireland stand a really good chance. However, it's been a bad week for England players who are playing in the WPL because some of them, well, all of them have had to make a decision. And some of them have made the decision to pull out of the WPL because it clashes with England series against New Zealand. Well, it doesn't quite clash. Mathematically, it's possible to get there, but you would be absolutely stupid to get on a flight straight after the WPL to get to New Zealand and play that evening. So Heather Knight, as captain of England, has pulled out um, and Lauren Bell has also withdrawn. Interestingly, though, John Lewis who is England head coach, is also a coach in the WPL, and he's sticking around. 
So a strange. I mean, maybe he'll deliberately make sure his team don't get to the final. To be fair, it's a good uh, good idea, but he might not get his job next year if that if that happens. It, well, it, it's it's a strange one, isn't it? Because this shouldn't really happen, um, and yet it is happening, and it and it actually is a bit of a threat to the international game. Mm. And I think if you consider, I mean, Lauren Bell and Heather Knight, I guess for them, it was a fairly easy decision to make. Heather Knight, because she's England captain. And effectively, if she said to CB, I'm going to play the WPL rather than yeah. um, Captain England, she would have lost the captaincy. Oh, 100%. Potentially. Yeah. Uh, for Lauren Bell, she's, probably on one of the lowest pay ranks in the WPL and didn't play a game at all last season. So actually it's much better for her to be playing for England than sitting on the bench in India. But however, maybe someone like Nat Siva Brunt, for whom, you know, the best part of 300 grand is resting on her part participation in the WPL, that's a lot more money than England are paying her. Mm -hmm. Probably three, four times as much money as she's getting um, for her England contract. So, and I guess for any of us, if, you know, for me as a teacher, if someone was saying for a month's work, I'll pay you triple your annual salary, and it clashed with sports day at my school, <laughs> then... Are you comparing England fixtures to sports day? Well, I'm, I'm just trying to get us normal people who have regular yeah. jobs to think yeah. about, about the decision that's having to be made here. No, I like the analogy. I think it's, it's good. Egg and spoon race. It, Yeah. I mean, it's an easy decision to make, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and then for someone like Izzy Wong, who's, you know, been in England squads but not really played in the last few um internationals not played since um you know she played a couple of games against Sri Lanka didn't she um we didn't work so well didn't play in the ashes um it seems to me that it would make sense for her to play w WPL rather than go to England mm. in New Zealand and not play yeah um, so they have got a decision to make and I guess the question is, will there be long-term consequences for players who make a decision to not play for England in these circumstances? Yeah, it's an interesting one because I, I hope there aren't implications, sanctions, all that sort of thing. And You'd imagine players will, would feel pressured to pick England, but I also hope there's some kind of mutual understanding of the situation because particularly, I think, about Nassau Brunt, she'll be retiring soon. And actually, I don't blame players who were kind of chasing the money because the money hasn't always been there. And for a lot of players, the money still isn't there. And actually securing your future when you have to retire in your 30s or whatever, I really don't see a problem with that. Um, I think I see it very differently to, for example, the men's game, where it's like, well, OK, why are you? prioritising franchise cricket over there. Like, I see it quite differently because of the stages of development that cricket's at in, in both sides of the sport. Um, and I think it's important that Heather Knight uh, plays for England because she's the captain um, and that's her full front responsibility. But I think it's very strange that John Lewis is allowed to be a coach in the WPI. I think firstly, like the fact he's a coach there, I find that a bit weird because I'm just like, aren't you supposed to be preparing with England? Like that's that front that, that's his job. Like his side hustle is the WPL, but now the side hustle is seemingly getting in the way of England. And I don't quite understand that dynamic. Um so I feel a little bit strange about it, but I I'm of the opinion that actually I'm I don't really mind what players do in this specific circumstance because I understand why players would pick either for loads of different reasons. Um, but I do worry that it's going to be something that's a dilemma that's going to pop up more because more franchise tournaments are popping up and, and franchise tournaments are offering more money now. Um, and I guess 
the ECB can control uh, like the 100 dates and things like that, but they have no power over uh, the international calendar with franchises and it's all a little bit messy with who has the power and the ICC, the BCCI, all that sort of thing. Ultimately, the ECB do have the power because mm -hmm. they can prevent contracted well, yeah, that's from true. Playing. But then the consequence of that, let's say you say to Natsiv Abrunt, we are not going to let you play WPL, then she will immediately announce her retire, <laughs> her retirement from international yeah. cricket in order to play the WPL and then every other franchise tournament across the world. Yeah. So you end up shooting yourself in the foot. Um, so they've got to play this quite carefully, mm. uh, I suggest. Uh, someone like Lauren Bell clearly has not had to think very long about it. It was an easy decision for her to make. Heather Knight, likewise, as I say, for other people, it's a trickier decision. But I think clearly the ECB are going to allow those players to make that decision and will grant them permission if they choose. That's how I read it anyway. Mm. I, I may be completely wrong and not understand the politics of this at all. Mm -hmm. But I think um, ECB would be unwise to kind of force the hand of players into announcing international retirements yeah in, in this style of south african cricket well indeed yeah and i mean yeah we we haven't spoken about this actually on the podcast but with west indies cricket and everything that's happened there i mean you think about deandra dotton basically retiring from international cricket and just playing franchise i know it's a different scenario but then of course they've had uh a trio of retirements um in recent weeks which does not look great and the state of West Indies cricket is is not looking good so yeah I think you ever had some regrets about that when she was sat in a soggy field in Welbeck well I had regrets when I was sat in a soggy field in Welbeck so I'm sure the world boss did too <laughs> Welbeck bingo card Woo! <laughs> To be fair, we are double bingo because we've got Welbeck and in the interview later on we mention the uh, the incident that shall not be named run out at the non-strike um, event. Yeah, so gosh. all the bingo cards, get your stamps out and um, block them off. Anyway, we're going to go for a review with the umpire because we want to see, do we like or do we not like? Is it out or is it not out? Project Darwin. Yes, it's an interesting one. Well, first thing to say about it is that it's more money. So more money is being put into the women's game, which has got to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, money is not yeah. as good. But um, there's investment in development, which is great. And now I suppose the weird thing about it is that it feels like these eight regional teams are just starting to establish their identity. And they're kind of being scrapped after three, four seasons. So that's not so good. But I guess what's replacing them is something that's going to be a lot more long term, potentially, uh, because having women's teams as part of an established county, it gives them a much stronger identity than they have. OK, so Central Sparks, for example, you know, we've used this example before when they played a um, uh a, a game alongside Warwickshire um, and the men's team played first uh, and I remember arriving to find thousands and thousands of people streaming away from the ground as Warwickshire's game finished all in their bears kit because Central Sparks meant absolutely nothing to them they weren't the bears uh, and I sat in a virtually deserted Edgebaston mm. watching that game so Clearly, to have teams which are part of an established identity and club and franchise and with a, their own ground, that has that's got to be a good thing. I think probably the other thing to bear in mind with the new structure is it's three divisions. So three divisions of eight teams. Suddenly, you've got that next level of not exactly professionalism, but next level of structure running alongside the full professional game in which that's the, there's that ability to develop younger players and for 
players who are sort of on the, you know, at the moment, you know, the Thea Brooks situation where someone falls out of the professional game and effectively that's it, it's game over. Um, you know, you can play some club cricket, you go and get yourself a job. It, it it allows a bit of a, if not a safety net, then a way back um, for players like that and, and the ability to develop later on. Um, because I think one of the weaknesses of this structure and the game that we have at the moment is that players either make it when they're teenagers or they don't make it at all. And um, so there's an opportunity, if you like, for people to take their time to develop and to, um, you know, and to become England internationals when they're 25 rather than when they're 17. Yeah, I agree. And I think that the tier thing's really interesting. And I know Melissa's story raised this on Twitter earlier today, that she's slightly sceptical because one of the issues is, okay, well, what if your childhood county becomes one of these professional teams? So say I played like age group for Warwickshire and I was in, I was playing for Warwickshire women. Now Warwickshire women suddenly turns into one of these professional teams. What happens to me? Cause I'm not, no, I'm not good enough to be a professional, but Warwickshire's my club. Did, does that mean I have to move to Worcestershire? And that, ho- that raises loads of problems because okay, Worcestershire and Warwickshire, they're quite close together, but there are other counties where there's like a lot further apart, like Kent and Surrey, for example, they're both very big counties. So does that mean I have to move house if I want to play county cricket? I have to buy a whole new set of kit. These are questions that I think do need to be addressed because it's not as straightforward. Um, and so I guess that's a slight question. Um, and I suppose, I don't know what the long-term plan is. I guess the end goal would probably to be have to have like 18 professional counties, for example, um a mirror the men's game but I think it is difficult when you're in that transition stage between the two and I think the way women's cricket has worked in the last I suppose probably since the Kia Super League it's been a bit strange with the regions and initially the regions worked in terms of professionalism and that's great that's brought professionalism to the game but the identity to teams all that sort of thing is non-existent and there are very few people that exist that are like, I'm a Western Storm fan. I'm a Central Sparks fan. Like, it's very, very, very small. I could probably count it on my hand. And that's actually not, that's not the fault of the marketing teams, if they ex- even exist. That's not the fault of the, the, the teams or whatever. It's because there's no history to it. There's no identity. Why on earth would a Warwickshire fan be like, I'm going to support Central Sparks? Because there are Worcestershire players on the team. Why would a Warwickshire fan be like, I want to support Emily Arlott because she, no, she plays for Worcestershire. That That's supporting a rival. And so you've got to be like, to a Warwickshire men's fan, this is the Warwickshire women's team. You should, yeah, I'll support them because they wear the bear and I support that. So it, it makes so much sense what they're doing now. Um it will just have its teething problems and that that's annoying, but it I feel like this is the perfect time to do it because you could leave the regions to develop for another three years. And then it, I think it just gets more difficult and more painful trying to swap back to the counties after that, if that makes sense. So I think it's a good, a positive step. I think it just needs a lot of thought because you want it want to do it right because it almost feels like with women's cricket, they've tried a lot of things and it's it's been a good effort, but it just hasn't quite worked. But th- we need to throw everything at this. We need to make sure this works because this is we want this to be like the last time it restructures sort of thing. We don't uh-huh. need more restructuring. Um, it won't be the last time. But <laughs> we need this to actually work like a long-term plan because I don't quite know what the long-term plan was with the regions, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, it was launched in the pandemic, wasn't it? So it was, yeah. um, it's a three-year plan. And and I think from what I hear, the, the three divisions, there'll be no promotion and relegation. So they're mm-hmm. set as they are yeah. in three years and then it gets reviewed at the end of it. Um, I guess 
what happens next will depend upon the development mm -hmm. and then you look you know the hundred as well and how it yeah. links into the hundred and, and what happens with that again things will continue to change mm. yeah so we'll see how that goes um it's all quite interesting uh but of course that won't come to light in until 2025 that's when it gets enacted so we'll be here more... you know, this time next year We'll oh be... my gosh it's 2025 next year i just realized that i was thinking oh, i was like three years away <laughs> wait so this is the final summer with the regions yeah. oh my god we need to hold a little funeral for all the teams the last time they played that's oh. right okay that's really cool we off guard <laughs> okay it's 2025 next year nice um wow anyway we have a guest this week we were fortunate enough to sit down and chat to Evie Ashton, who is absolutely fantastic. She's a sports journalist, and you have probably seen her articles across the BBC and various other outlets, because her coverage of women's cricket is exceptional, particularly telling the stories that don't get told, but it's the stories that make watching cricket so much better and add so much value to it, because you know a little bit about these players' lives now. You know the struggles they've experienced you know when they win something you know how much that means and that is what I love about particularly Evie's writing because it just brings that to light so enjoy our chat with Evie So, Evie, what's your cricket story and how did you first get into the sport of cricket? Okay, well, originally, like, I was a tennis player. Um, so from, like, the age of six until, like, well, until now, but I've been a bit injured. Um, but, yeah, when I when the pandemic came, um, I kind of wanted to pick up a new sport and felt like the, the single sort of life in tennis, like, it's very, like, on yourself. It's quite demoralising and it's not that fulfilling um but I love I love tennis as a sport don't get me wrong it's great for your fitness but cricket has that like team aspect so I tried it in the pandemic but just softball and like I guess tennis kind of gives you like that hand-eye coordination so quite enjoyed it and I tried it at uni because I joined uni just off you know the pandemic like lockdown was May 2020 I started uni in September and then joined Warwick cricket club and then yeah I had a bit of an obsession from then like I just loved the people loved playing like something new and just like that team vibe yeah then kept playing it and like I don't rate myself at all I'm not good at it whatsoever but I just love like the vibes They're just unbeatable in that way and yeah since then I've just like kind of been playing on and off uh, I've been injured for quite a while so I've not been able to play as much as I'd like to but slowly getting back into it at the moment and yeah sport. yeah but I'm, I'm interested in the tennis so are you were you like a serious tennis player? Are you a serious tennis player with like a ranking and all that sort of thing? Yeah, I had a ranking. It was like I played I played for my county, but it wasn't that serious. Like it was like I never wanted to be professional. It was just I loved doing it. And then I was really privileged that I had like my parents supporting me and like took me to all these tournaments and competitions. So it wasn't like ever serious. Like I never wanted to go professional. But I just wanted to try as much as hard as I could, if that makes sense, because it was just really cool. And yeah, it didn't have that team aspect, as I said, but at the time I really enjoyed it. And yeah, I got a, good, a lot of good things out of it as just like character building <laughs> in terms of that way. But yeah, I guess like I did a bit of tennis at uni as well, because that was what I was good at. Um, but then cricket kind of seemed to like, I don't know, it just had, like I said, it had that like team aspect, which you kind of struggle to get in tennis you get it in doubles but yeah just something about cricket <laughs> now I, and now of course you're a freelance journalist and I see your articles all over the place on the BBC website in particular how on earth did all that happen because because you're not that old really are you no I'm only 22 so so when I joined uni at Warwick I started uh thinking about like what I want to do with my life because <laughs> I had no idea um, and I thought like maybe journalism, maybe like sports writing. So I wrote, started writing for the paper, uh, the like Warwick Ball is what it's called. And yeah, I enjoyed it. And um, I ended up 
writing this quite big article about um sexism in sport at Warwick and we did this like big un investigatory that's not even a word big investigation like sort of uh story which was I think that was a turning point for me because um it made me realize that like journalism can be a bit more of a force for good rather than just like telling uh kind of like what's happened in a match um so yeah after I did that piece because it also kind of uh fit in with my degree at the time which was like philosophy politics and economics and yeah so it was just a nice sort of like combination between and then yeah once I did that piece it kind of I just got really invested in it and like wanting to continue covering like women's cricket so then I applied for the 100 rising role and I was really lucky to get that and did that in the 2021 summer and I really enjoyed that and then because we got to write for BBC Sport um I had like a new link with them and then they offered a freelance cricket writer role so I applied to that and then I got that so now that kind of takes us up to today so I've just been like doing freelance cricket writing for them like you know like the live text I sometimes do a few shifts but Manchester is miles away so it's it's hard to do that often um for me <laughs> um I know you're like I think you're near Manchester probably but yeah, yeah. um yeah so then I like tried to branch out to more than cricket because cricket is amazing but like there's so many other sports with so many amazing stories so I tried to do that um I'm rambling a bit but yeah now I'm doing my master's at St Mary's in sports journalism to get the NCTJ qualification because my degree did not teach me journalism <laughs> and I need to if I want to do it as a career I'm going to need like you know, to like learn about actually doing journalism, if that makes sense. Wow, yeah, that's amazing. I think that I think your best answer that I really like there is saying that um that you you wrote a, a a piece about sport and it fitted in really well with your degree in philosophy. Which and it's interesting that you should link those two things because I was assuming oh you maybe you were studying journalism, maybe you were studying English. But actually I think it's really, really right what you're saying that sports journalism has got to be more than just reporting who scored the goals and what minute it happened in. And it's actually looking at what sport tells us a little bit about ourselves and our society as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like when I did my degree, like I was really passionate about the subjects, but I wasn't really sure how I could turn it into something like that could make change. I mean, everyone makes, everyone makes a change in their own way. Like like every job in the world contributes somewhat but I just I didn't really know how people like because conventionally like stereotypically people who do PPE like go into investment banking and I didn't really want to do that so I wanted something a bit more like I don't know like day-to-day -day, like something that maybe fit in with sport and that seemed to overlap so yeah I don't really know where this is going but when I saw that journalism had like that huge kind of like power and how it link links in with like democracy like if you if you want to have a good working democracy in any country, then people have got to be informed. And if they're not informed, then I feel like that takes a lot of power away from them. So if I feel like I can do that, then then great. Nice indeed. <laughs> indeed. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I <laughs> <laughs> just can't get a bit philosophical, <laughs> philosophical sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, I guess we see sport being used as a force for good so often. And sport can be a reflection of society in a positive or negative way. So being able to tell those stories, and there are so many good sporting stories, most of them will never be told um, because they're, they're just not known. Um, but tell us about some of the highlights of some of the stories you've covered before or, or you know, people's lives you, you've you got to hear about. I guess I don't, I, I really enjoyed speaking to everyone, each story that I've done. Um, so I'd probably have to go through all of them. But if, if I had to, I guess the, the one that... I really enjoyed speaking to my Boucher and Karis Paveley and Kevin Baker. Those have been my three standout ones from this year. And I've really enjoyed speaking to them. Um, I guess like my, like she just seemed so like passionate when she spoke to me and like, so wanting to just have that conversation. And like, despite it being so personal to her, like it just seemed quite brave for her to like, just tell her story. And like, I just felt quite, I don't know, it just it was nice that she felt confident that I could like take those words and write her story for her. Um, and hopefully like 
for me it was about maybe if someone reads that article then not even like it'll make you come out or anything but it'll make you feel maybe more comfortable less alone in the world or you know what I mean and so that that was quite nice and yeah what was it yeah Karis Pavley the one with about she so she has ADHD and um yeah for context my abuse year that that article was about her like her coming out story because she did a story with her girlfriend uh her partner and then I just wanted to hear her side of it because we don't really heard them as a relationship yeah and then Karis with ADHD she she was also amazing to speak to um just like to dig really into like the depth of like how society treats people with ADHD which is quite not great <laughs> it's not great at the moment so yeah just as I was, yeah as I mentioned before just using those stories to highlight some real injustices that do occur and uh, because they have this platform is perfect because they can speak about issues that they've faced and how sport has helped them kind of cope with it or when Karis's case like they literally gave her the diagnosis that she needed and um yeah I guess with Kevin Baker he now lives with a stoma and yeah just hearing how the fact that disability cricket kind of kept him going at such a dark time in his life um I guess that can be quite like relatable to a lot of people and ultimately for me I think each of those three pieces like is about kind of creating the emotional like pull and like the relatability to show that these people are humans off off the pitch and like making it more than just sport. It's like these people have their lives and they're outside. And that's what we love kind of about sport as well. Um, that we're not just watching them for their skill or technique, but maybe because they did something like, or you relate to them in some way or they've gone through something relatable. Um, yeah, and it just gives you another reason to love their sport or them. Yeah, because I feel like there was a lot I don't know, personally, I've read a few articles where it really just takes the humanity out of it. And for me, I just quite like bringing the humanity to it because we often do forget that these people are real and they live their lives. Um, that's a long-winded question way to answer your question, Polly. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, Polly's really good at editing. It's no, not a problem at all. I, I, I'm just wondering to what extent The 100 Rising was quite helpful for you in terms of building those relationships because quite well and build some quite good relationships in doing that, which enables stories to be told. For Southern Brave, for example, there was the rising reporter, which was me, where it's just match reports and being in the press box and then having the opportunity to interview three players outside of that, like just for a feature, a, a feature. But for me, the 100 Rising was important in terms of just like the contact with the, with the BBC and just probably on like a more personal note, just knowing that that's what I really enjoyed, feeling happy <laughs> doing it, uh, not to get too soppy. But yeah, I don't I don't think I'd be anywhere where I am without the 100 Rising role. I've always, I think about it quite a lot and just like, it was quite lucky in a way that it came in that time because if the pandemic hadn't happened, I wouldn't have got that role because it would have been the year before. Um, so there's a whole lot of circumstance and luck for me to get that. And it has played a huge role to where I am today. So yeah like just purely because I got to write my first BBC feature out of the 100 Rising and then I wouldn't be able to write I guess I'd be doing other things it's not to say I wouldn't be a journalist I just wouldn't be writing for the BBC if that makes sense so yeah it was quite pivotal in that way. So you mentioned about uni what was your kind of involvement with uni cricket and how did that kind of help your love because I play for my uni cricket team at the moment and I guess with with going to uni and stuff, it, it's really nice to meet people who understand cricket because certainly in my, none of my friends understand it. But when I'm at cricket, everyone knows it. Um, and it's kind of like a nice little bubble. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It was like a bubble for me. Like uni of Warwick women's cricket. It was, it was such a fundamental part of my uni life, especially when my whole first year was literal rubbish because of the pandemic, like online lectures, like online socials like are like first ever ex my first ever experience of a nightclub was on tables of six <laughs> like <laughs> heartbroken <laughs> I'm not even that much of a clubber like I don't really rate it that much personally but I was just like wow what a time um but yeah in terms of like cricket yeah I completely I have the exact same uh feeling like it was like I invested so much of my time purely because like 
I enjoyed it. And then in second year, like, um, I became part of the exec, so like responsible for running the club. And that was like a whole new dimension. It is incredibly time consuming. It's fulfilling, but it's incredibly time consuming. Um, so it was almost like doing another degree on the side, like just the hours that you put into it is insane. Um, it was really good, but it's, it's kind of what you put into it. And I wanted to put a lot into it because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So it was draining in that sense. <laughs> But it really added a dimension to university life that I just wouldn't have had if I hadn't like thrown myself into cricket. Um, maybe I should have gone to some other things, which I do think about. But yeah, I mean, like, how's cricket for you at um, Manchester, Holly? Yeah, I'm, I'm at Man Matt. So we just get thrashed and everything. <laughs> we we get, or it gets thrashed everything. We're bottom of the table. So we're just like, yeah, we win at the vibes every time. <laughs> yeah, likewise, we turn it with one bat and hope for the best, ask to borrow the opposition's bats awkwardly and just best the vibes. Do you not have, like, I don't know, how many, like, county players? Do you not have a lot of county players then? No. We have one, I think, and she hasn't played any of our books fixtures. Most of the people have never played before. Um, Holly is actually one of the best players. Remarkably. I mean, that tells you the standard. <laughs> so mean, but also so true. Um... But yeah, we're very much there for the vibes, there for a laugh. We like we played against, um, I think it was Sheffield, and uh, also no, it was yeah, it was Sheffield where Lizzie Scott was their coach. We turned up; they had like ten extra people with banners and stuff cheering them on. We turned up with six people, one bat. Then so my bat, my pair of gloves, no scorer, um, no food, and we were just like, yeah, we're we're here for a good time, not a long time. So yeah, but uni cricket is great. But I guess it's funny, isn't it? Because it's one of those things that when you go to university, you end up doing stuff like that, which is totally out of your experience and comfort zone and so on. But actually, it prepares you really well for the workplace because that's essentially what the workplace is like. Whereas your degree doesn't really prepare you for the workplace at all. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I learned so much about like, I don't know if this is the right way to phrase it, like like managing people, like... I just wouldn't have got that through my degree. And I don't know where else I would have got that. Just like managing a team and like mm -hmm. balancing, like not being micromanaging, like micromanaging to what extent I achieved that. I don't know, mm -hmm. but <laughs> like, just like, and making sure everyone's happy and managing conflict. Like the admin stuff was so easy. It's like the managing when people like, com like have a conflict and the, oh my God, that's the worst thing. I'm saying that from like a very privileged position of being able to get on there because I'm well aware of like like even going like to uni and having those positions are very like I'm very privileged but yeah it was character building. So to finish off this might actually be quite a difficult question what is your favourite cricket game you've ever watched? I don't I didn't watch this live but I always watch the highlights of the Women's World Cup 2017 final I never watched that I didn't even like cricket then I'm like a fake cricket fan, but I love watching like those highlights and just any, and just that match in general. Like, oh, it's such a common answer, but yeah. And I guess the other one that I watched live would be when when Charlie Dean got run out at the non-striker's end. Oh, I just remember that so vividly. And I think I was with my dad and I was just like, did that just happen? Like, what's, hello? <laughs> And just being absolutely like not starstruck, but just like because I felt like we invested like our entire like the past. I don't know. It was like her innings like went on for so long, and like they were like just clawing back and so well, and like it was such an underdog moment, and it all just went in like a matter of a matter of seconds. So that just sticks out to me quite a lot, and I enjoyed it. It was just frustrating, but like it was still like amazing drama, and I'm like here for the drama. That was amazing. We were there in 2017. But we weren't particularly into women's cricket at the time. We just uh, we just somehow ended up there. And Polly was only twelve at the time, and uh, it was just un unbelievable that match. It, it was just you know I said at the time and still think it's the best sporting event I've ever been to. And yeah, you're right. The Charlie Dean run out was I couldn't quite believe what I was seeing. It was yeah, and then was really quite upset about it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it actually did quite a lot for women's cricket in terms of boosting it a bit, because also the kind of chaos and that sort of thing, you see it a bit in men's cricket. 
but it never happens in women's cricket. And I like that it happened at the time. There is video of evidence of me being absolutely fuming. There have been podcasts where I was really angry. I had death threats in my DMs like this. It was not good. But now I kind of see the good side of it. Um, and I think also it it doesn't necessarily create a rivalry. But next, like whenever England and India meet, you think, oh, is it going to happen again? And I quite like that. Yeah, absolutely. The way that the men were tweeting about it. I was like, you would never tweet any other women's match. Shut up. <laughs> It, it was great at grabbing the headlines and the tension. And I think my favourite bit is it was the shots of the balcony afterwards. And you had um, Sophie Eggleston and Sophia Dunkley and the scowls on their face. Or it's the slight incredulity of the whole thing was just brilliant. Yeah, it, it was so painful to watch their faces, but just seeing those reactions, I remember and just being like, <laughs> they're watching it too. And they're equally like... But yeah, it, it did do bits for the sport in fairness. Not an ideal way to do it, but you're so right, Polly, in that regard. Evie, it's been brilliant to talk to you. And uh, and yeah, freelance journalist. That's Freelance means zero hours contract, really, doesn't it? it it's a, a posh word for zero hours contract. Well, I can't even claim to be a freelancer at this point. Like, I'm not... I haven't even like gone into like the depths of freelance world yet. I'm like in a safe little bubble at the moment. Like, yeah, it, like with my it, parents, the bank of my parents, and like, do you know what I mean? Like at uni, like I am like <laughs> I have no idea what it is like fully like I'm thinking about whether to even like do it, but like when once you leave uni and like go through like freelance, I don't know. I just heard like it's incredibly like you say, like zero hours. Mm, like potential not, starvation. <laughs> And you're not you're not gonna know like even already I've had experiences of just not being paid for like quite a long time and I'm like if I was doing this freelance mm, how would I be paying my bills and it, yeah not having that like certainty over payment thank you so much and thank you Love for having me you. on the podcast yeah it was great no, to no meet problem. you both yeah Thanks for enjoy this conversation so much so thank you. I love that thought that sports reporting is more than giving the score. Yeah. And uh, that's definitely what Evie brings to the party. I really enjoyed that chat with her. Yeah, it was really interesting. A very, very good quote as well. Um, and it's just, it's fascinating to hear how actually this, you know, journalism and, and sports journalism just kind of appeared to her at uni. It wasn't something she was thinking of of going into from a young age or anything um and actually also love for cricket started at uni as well which is uh which is amazing so yeah really interesting so thank you Evie for being an amazing podcast guest we'll be back next week Paul oh I hope so I hope I will be back next week um we will probably have another guest we've got a couple uh, of interviews ready to do so we'll be back next week in the meantime you can follow us on social media so our instagram is naughty child podcast along with our tiktok and our twitter is a podcast